This week's episodes were brought to you by Snoopy. Hey folks, Quill18 here, and welcome to another episode of our Project Mighty Spud, our Unity game engine, terrain engine work, is what I meant to say over here. And we're very, near, very nearly done, I suspect. Maybe not this episode, but I think next episode might end up being our last one, assuming we're able to successfully complete the final bit of our task, which is to be able to go from the surface and into space and back. Um, but one of the things I, I often repeat is the mantra that premature optimization is the root of all evil. It's a, it's a very helpful saying to stop yourself from wasting time on things that aren't that important, so on and so forth. But actually, at this point, we have enough of the terrain engine in place that a little bit of optimization is uh, is well-suited, because we can look into that. And in particular, when we go to and back from space, we're going to have to regenerate the terrain, and trying to cut that down will be nice. Now, one of the ways that you can... It's not an optimization. In fact, it can literally sometimes make the process take a little bit longer, but more importantly, it can make things more smooth for the user experience, is to use coroutines or threads or something like that that to generate um, objects and items and things like that in the background while the game is still running so it doesn't actually freeze. We are not going to tackle that, this in this tutorial, um, and that's not an example of optimization, but it is an example of usability. But I did do a round of optimization over here, and I was able to cut my terrain generation time from on my computer from 5.6 seconds to 2.5 seconds, cutting it more than in half. And I got to give a shout out to Carl Goodlow, who sent me a message on Patreon, uh, who started this little optimization um, track. So first of all, I'm going to point out that what I did to be able to tell if we're making gains is I used uh, the stopwatch class over here to just start a timer and stop a timer around build from landing spot. Now, um, you'll notice I'm not doing the using of system.diagnostics, which you would normally do just to be able to access the stopwatch class a little bit more conveniently, um, including system.diagnostics and system and a few different things. Sometimes there's a there's a couple of collisions with some of the namespace stuff. And I was like, you know what? I can just write it out the whole way here. I don't need to only be able to write stopwatch. Anyway, so we start a timer, we stop it, and then I output the time over here so that we know how many seconds it takes. And on my computer, it took 5.6 seconds to generate the terrain, but now it's, well, about 2.5. We'll call it 2.5 over here to generate. So how did it happen? Well, um, the email I got from Carl, in his email, he had suggested that if we, because we had a division over here, right? Um, inside of, hang on, it was actually, he pointed out specifically in paint clips. Okay, this is how it all started. In this loop that we are looping through every pixel in the alpha map, we were doing a division over here where our AX was being divided by um, terrain alpha width minus one, right? So you can see here, this W terrain um, is the terrain data alpha width is being put in W. And here you can see the W minus one. Well, that was in the division, right? So over here, we're dividing, AX was being divided by the width minus one in there. Um, and he had discovered that if he had moved this division outside of the loop, things went faster. Now, I, I think that in general, the divisions are a little bit more demanding than the multiplication. And so leaving this out here, right, doing the, the division here and then turn into a multiplication here might have some games. I suspect that in the end, this does not actually represent a significant boost. Um, as much as what actually is providing the boost, and I did not see this coming, and it only became evident, so I implemented this over here, um, and I decided to, um, yeah, I'd implement it here and implement it somewhere else, and then what I finally did is I ran the, uh, the profiler, right? Unity has an excellent profiler, and I'm not gonna open it now, because I'm worried that if I were to do it, so the profiler over here, if I were to do it now because the settings I had it set up with the deep pro profile on, it'll probably just like hang everything for a minute while it like processes things because the deep profiler really is quite demanding. But when I ran that, I discovered that after making these changes, after making these changes, um, I didn't run the profiler before, I could have, but you know, after I made these changes, I wanted to see if there was still anything because it was still, I brought the job down from I think 5.6 seconds to 5.3, which is, you know, pretty notable. Uh, saving. It's not It's not quite 10%, you know, it's probably, what, like 8% or something like that, but that's pretty notable saving. Sure, okay. And I want to see if there was anything else outstanding that would, that would just stand out. And that's the thing. Do most of your work, then run your profiler and see if there's anything in particular that soaks up most of your time. And the answer was that, and this really surprised me, that it was the build structures function over here that was eating a ton of the time, a ridiculous amount of the time, and I couldn't figure out why. Now, 
Partially, when you run in the profiler, the things that take the amount of time will not be balanced in exactly the same way that if you weren't running the profiler. Just because of the way that it interacts with things, it can make certain areas be more excessively overblown than before, but it still tends to do a really good job of pointing out the, the problem spots. Um, so build structures was a problem by far in the profiler, eating up something like 80% of the cycle time. I was like, what? So, I mean, first of all, that probably means there's more optimization that be, can be done here. But it turns out, when I dug even deeper into the, the function call, of the, the fact that build structure is taking up like 80% of our, of our processing time, about 60% of that time was specifically spent on these calls, the dot width and the dot height. And that's when I realized that these are not simple naked properties internally to these textures, okay? When you access a texture and you look for the width and height, it's not just a number that gets returned instantly. It's not like this is a property that looks like, uh, you know, public uh, int um, width get, oops, get return some int, okay? That's apparently not what these are, because otherwise this would be this would be really fast. It'd, effect, it'd probably be inlined by the compiler and everything like that and be super, super, super fast. It's clearly not. It must be accessing the freaking array memory or something. I don't know. So it turns out this was really slow. So simply by grabbing this and shoving it into a, an integer over here and then using that integer here, well, here, here, um, I think there's somewhere else as well. Yeah, right over here in these divisions, for example. Um, simply by doing that, that's when I cut the runtime from the now at that point 5.3 seconds down to 2.5 on my computer, um, saving us more than half of our processing time simply by doing this, which is insane. So these are the sort of things that like, that's why like you may not have realized that going ahead of time. And most of the time, things that look like this are perfectly fine and will never consume much of your CPU, but it turns out when you're interacting with textures, that was it. And so that's why I think with Carl, um, when he uh, suggested doing this sort of change, which actually in his original way was like this, right? Was like this. When he suggested this change, I don't think it's this division that saves time. And I could go and rechange it and confirm. I don't think it's the division. I think it's the fact that now when we're in the loop, this width adjust doesn't have to use doesn't have to look up the terrain data's uh, alpha map width over here because it's pre-cached. It's I don't think it's about caching the division. I think it's about caching that. But um, we may as well leave it out here. Who cares? It's fine. Sure. Uh, we could compare one or the other, but I'll leave that as a thing for you guys. So anyway, that made me very happy, and I want to talk about that. But on to the real content of today, which is trying to go to and from space over here. Um, so what can we do about that? Well, first of all, let's go back to our coordinate, oops, to coordinate test scene over here, where we have our moon over here, which is quite a bit grayer because we're not actually applying a, um, a texture material to it in any way. We are just using the grayscale um, imagery, which I mean, the moon probably should be gray as opposed to our golden color that we're playing with uh, from our splats just to mess around with things, but that's okay. All right, so we have our ship. And so the thing I want to do with the ship is I want to confirm that our expectations for a ship position are matching on our planet. If we recall, and actually, um, our moon over here is using the sphere mat over here, which is using this albedo texture. Um, what I want is to use the test topography instead. Boop, that way we can see our words. Excellent, aha, isn't that lovely? And so what I want to do is confirm. Now, note that this is not being used as a height map or anything. This is just being applied directly, but that's okay. Um, right over here, this is this is supposed to be our zero, zero, zero point. So we need to make sure we do that. Because when we originally like designed our little orbit view, I think we had a slightly different coordinate system in mind. But we're going to properly use the point where on the equator at the prime meridian, which is right, uh, I think it's between the 5 and the E over here, that's our zero, zero point. So if we get our ship which is currently hovering over that, right? It's got no rotation whatsoever. It's just 5,000 units above that point. It should be reporting that we are at zero degrees, zero degrees, which is not the case. And the reason for that is because we've done a little bit of twisting at some point before. First of all, if I go and remove this rotation from the moon um, graphics, just out of curiosity. Well, that's interesting. I mean, and then, oops, and then if we did put our ship over in that direction, 
uh, which I guess would be negative x and 0z. Oh, wait, hold on. Does this not update in real, in real time? Do you have to run the game to find that out? Oh! Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Undo. 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 I did not realize that was not as set to execute in the editor. Okay, so now once again we have our ship floating here. If I hit play, are we correctly getting zero, zero? Oh, we are! Oh, shit. Okay, we're fine. Good. Because, yeah, the moon graphics needed that rotation just to equalize it. But the big thing is that the moon itself, so ignore the moon graphics, which will always need, like, weird rotations if you're bringing it in from, you know, a... a, a um, I don't know, Blender or whatever like that. That's fine. Um, but the moon itself has no rotation, and if the ship is just uh, at positive Z, then it's at the zero, zero marker. Um, we could change this. If I went into this text, so it updates itself over here. If I open this up and tell it to um, execute in edit mode, It'll recompile. There we go. So this should be running constantly, even when we're in, in edit mode now. And indeed it does there. See, that's much better. I like that a lot better. Okay, so I don't have to run the game. We get the update. I should have done that ages ago. I just assumed I did because it seemed like an obvious thing. So now we've got a, we've got a match. So in theory, if we look here and we're at zero, zero in space, we're at the right zero, zero on the ground. So now we have to work out the transition. So, I mean, we've got our ship, technically have a graphic for it, things like that. We want to land the ship. And so here's where it does get a little bit more hairy here. Because what we need to do is we do have to, um, we have to transfer. Now, I'm not going to transfer scenes. In my setup, I had two different scenes. But I don't think we want to do that. Because if you transfer scenes, then, you know, it's going to delete everything, reload everything. Um, and definitely will never be a smooth transition. I would love to have it trans... Um, transition smoothly from one to the other without any real effort. So what I think we can do though is I think if we grab this canvas and the moon like do we just copy it into the other scene? Maybe. I could also just make, well, actually you know what might be a good idea? Just to avoid any kind of weird trouble. What if we make a duplicate? I'm going to duplicate this scene. So this we're going to call the um, combined scene like this. So it's got the dynamic terrain master in here, which might start deactivated, for example. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, and then in the coordinate test scene, oops, I duplicated it, but I was modifying the terrain test scene. Hold on. There, save you. In the combined scene, there we go. Disable the dynamic terrain master. That's going to be fine. Um, and then in the coordinate testing, we're going to grab the moon, the ship, and the canvas. And I guess the event system needs to exist over here. And can I paste? I can. Good. Okay. So now, and then we might do something like, I don't know, turn off the moon. I'm not, I'm not sure which one it would be. Um, let's assume we were going to start in space. I think that's fine. I think that's fair. So we've got the moon. We've got the ship. Uh, we've got a light that is kind of poopy, right? Because it was the other light. Um, light dash ground. Let's turn that off. Save this. Go into the court test scene. Copy this and paste it in here. Light dash space. Excellent. We'll put them side by side to make it easier to see. Oh, we already had a disabled sphere in here, but let's go away. Okay, so we've got a moon, we've got a ship. We've got our canvas, which is still reporting our ship's coordinates currently in space, which is fine. We've got the dynamic terrain master is disabled right now. I think also what we're going to want to do in our dynamic terrain master, we are no longer want, going to want to call um, this at the start. So first of all, we're going to change it. So in the start function, I'm just going to comment out the build from landing spot. I'm going to move the debug thing. I think it's still helpful to have the timer spit things out. I'm just going to move this inside of build from landing spot. And at the end of build from landing spot, we're going to do that. Okay. So we're no longer auto calling this from start and build from landing spot is a public function that can be triggered from something else, i.e. our ship landing. So what we need now, and what I'll probably do is start it as a button. 
right? Because I don't think we're going to implement actual controls for our spaceship. That sounds like that, that's out of scope for this particular project. I don't know how we want the spaceship to fly. But what I do want in our canvas is I want a bouton button here. I'm going to stick it in the top right corner. And I'm going to just call this the, I don't know, land ship button. Okay. The idea is when we push this button, then we are going to convert from space mode to ground mode. And we're going to use the ship's coordinates to determine what terrain chunk we should create. So that, that'll be the, the first bit. Button dash land ship. Like that. Okay. So I think what we need is I think we need some sort of object that will keep this organized for us. Seems like a, like a decent idea. Like imagine, so we create some sort of empty and we're gonna call this something like, I don't know, coordinate manager or something like this. I, I don't know. I don't know if that's the, the ideal name. I mean, it doesn't really matter that much, but at the same time, it sort of informs what's gonna happen. So we're gonna create a C-sharp script called coordinate manager. I'm gonna, oops, move it into there and apply it to here. Okay, and its job, its job is to convert things from one coordinate or one like sort of viewpoint to another, right? So we're gonna have something like, um, we're gonna have a public reference to say, I don't know, the game object of like the moon. Obviously in, in a more sophisticated game, you're gonna want multiple planets and objects and things like that, but that's gonna be beyond the scope of this. So we're gonna say like the, like, well, it's always the moon. It's like, I don't know, the sphere, public, game object, the terrain. Okay? And we're going to have some sort of public void um, switch to terrain, like this. Um, and I guess we're going to need a reference to the public uh, transform... Um, what, I don't know, that's an interesting question. I mean, the ship, sort of? But actually, the coordinate display, what do you have a reference to? Target object, parent object. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be similar to this. Yeah. Switch to terrain, so... We are in space mode, but have to switch to terrain mode. Um, wh what are the coordinates of the ship relative to the planet, planetoid? Yeah, yeah, let's call it that. Planetoid. I like that word. So we can use a similar thing to what we had before, where we are using the ship's position and the planetoid dot transform dot position. These will give us the spherical coordinates of the ship in the same way that we're using it for the display. So, I mean, we could confirm something like this if we, um, again, we're gonna be lazy here. String S is equal to that. So we're gonna say, um, Landing ship at coordinates, bam, sphere coordinates this. So what we're going to do is we are going to tell the planetoid to set active false. We're going to hide the planet. We are then going to tell the terrain to set active true. And the terrain get component um, dynamic terrain master dot build from landing spot and we just feed it spherical coordinates which we have so we're going to tell it to build coordinate uh, build the landing spot there so now if we go to here and we let that compile a little bit okay and oh oh right we're not actually debugging that debug dot log there i know i don't actually have to put in a string but it was just easier and lazier to copy and paste there so um, right, so the button 
we're going to give it an on click event. And when you get clicked, you're going to tell the coordinate manager that it should run the switch to terrain thing. Um, and I guess maybe what we'll do is put a little like bool is terrain. We'll set it to false. And um, we'll say if is terrain, then we'll just say debug.log error already in terrain mode. Boom, 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 boom. Return. Um, and then is terrain is equal to true. Okay. All right, so um, let's hit this button. So obviously this is gonna be a sudden transition. There's all sorts of things you might wanna to do to actually fade this out. Instead of setting to set active, and actually I should put in some comments about that. Uh, so land ship, whoops. Of course we need to actually assign where these references. Uh, that's no moon, uh, that's no terrain, that's no ship, okay good. Hit play, land ship. There we go, we should pause for the 2.5 seconds. And we have landed at the coordinates over here. Well, we've generated the terrain at the correct coordinates, or so we think. What if instead, right, we take our ship, so that's fine. So we landed at the five to E, but let's take the ship and just move it slightly to the side. There you go, about one degree eastwards. Uh, is that true? Wouldn't east be the opposite direction? I'm just saying, isn't east to the right? Yeah, so anyway, we'll, we'll take a look at that in a moment. But just out of curiosity, if I do this, now, I mean, visually, it feels to me when you hit the land ship button that it should land us on top of the D. But the fact that it says east is making me think it'll land us on top of the F. Let's find out. Okay, it definitely is going towards the E and the F. Nice to see our train is still, or our little structure is still working though. Okay, so two things. One, the terrain is correctly being generated from these spherical coordinates. That's great. The other thing though is that the transform to spherical is wrong. Transform to spherical is wrong. That's it. Um. It needs to use, I think it needs to use the inverse of our Euler angle. Um, no, the inverse of this one here. So if I just go and invert that, compile, 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 and, huh? That doesn't feel right. Why is it saying zero? Why is it? Shouldn't be saying nothing. Is it something about the string? The what? I wonder if we just want to invert that. Still, I, I don't know why. But just out of curiosity, is there any chance that I actually just want to invert the direction here? Uh, no, that's not right. Because then if I bring the x back down to zero, we're on the wrong side. So no, we were good there. It must be it must be a bug in our in our two string. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. Go to declaration of this. Hang on. 
Sorry, I'm being silent. My bad. I'm trying to like read and think a little bit here. Um, let's just change this momentarily to actually just print out latitude and longitude. Because why not, right? Hit play. Well, actually, I don't even have to hit play. I just have to let it recompile. Put you back at zero. Um... Yeah, why is it? What's going on here? That's printing the longitude as a zero all the time. So it's taking this, and then what? Nothing is satisfying. Oh, I know. Yeah. Okay, hold on. Derp, 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 derp. Yes, of course. That totally makes sense. Okay. Because we're ending up with a. Oh, I don't have to hit play. We're number this. Do we have to go instead of doing this? Is it 360 minus that? Is that more what I'm having? I don't like the fact that I'm sitting here just guessing at these numbers. There's no way that's healthy. Okay, that looks much more correct. That looks much more correct. So now it should be telling us east, and now it's going to hit west. There we go. Okay, so let's uh, let's repeat what we we're doing before where I move it over here to look like we're hanging out over the D, which will sort of never stop being funny. I can't, I guess this is probably, I'm trying, trying to see like if we're going directly through the world. So at this point we should be just above the D. It's correctly reporting now that it's west. So now it should be generating the correct terrain for what we're actually asking for. Again, it wasn't any wrong, anything wrong with our terrain generation. It was our transform to spherical coordinate generation that was wrong. Uh, oh, kept expecting it to just happen as soon as I hit play. No, no, I have to hit land ship. And indeed, there we go, just over the D. So that part is good. Let's run this one more time and test that the sort of north-south works. So if I go southwards over here and sort of put the transform to look like it's going through the world, somewhere around there, we should be right in the middle of the D, land ship. Okay, in this case, in this case, our transform coordinates are correct. So again, if I hit play, and actually, you know what? Hold on. I don't want to hit play because I want to be able to make the changes outside here. So if I drop this down, it is correctly reporting that we are south, which is right. All right, so we're at somewhere like this. There we go. So we're at five degrees south. That is correct. We definitely should be over the south, which is okay. But when we hit this and then we hit the land ship button, it's actually generating the train north because we're seeing the four instead of the D. That is an issue inside of Dynamic Train Master where the landing spot bits is the entirety of the problem that when we convert from the spherical coordinates to the rotation, maybe that's it. Maybe this is literally the spot right here that we have to put a negative around the latitude here. Will that fix all of our problems? I don't know. So again, our ship is hovering over here. We can hit play, obviously nothing changes. The south over here, land ship. This is such a big change to every, oh my God, that is literally the only thing we had to change. Holy crap. Holy crap, and it's amazing. Can you believe, like, we've been operating this whole time on, on this having, like, and this is an important function call, and the latitude was being inverted the whole time, but it's fine. It may have been one of the reasons that when I was trying to do, like, some of the tests for the rotation and, like, trying out different landing spots that I was never sure, like, what direction to go in, right? Uh, so if you're doing a rotation test... Um, yeah, so with, with our rotation test, I was 3 and minus 4 into latitude here, and maybe it would have been a positive 4 to get the uh, expectation I was looking for. But okay. Oh, so, inverting the sign here has fixed it all. 
because now indeed we're supposed to line at five degrees south, 10 degrees west, which is about right in the middle of the D. So we're now generating the correct terrain chunks. Um, the inverse is still something we'd like to have happen where um, we've got that. Now we could actually move the ship as well, right? Let's say we actually took this ship after landing and like put it down. Look, rotation viewing vector is zero. Oh yeah, that's fine. Uh, put it down aligned with the train, which is, oop, right? So if we hit land ship, it would be nice to actually get the ship to actually land flush with the terrain. Our terrain is legitimately huge here. Where the hell is it? Down here. Oh my god. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to automate that. And the thing is, we can do this very easily, right? Because we know how to get the train height somewhere. So first of all, let's get rid of this look rotation viewing vector zero warning. Um, oh, which happens inside of there. So if dear to target, yeah. If dear to target dot uh, magnitude, we can even use square magnitude to save ourselves from a square root operation. Um, if it's equal to zero, um, then parent and target is the same. So force a um, zero, zero um, chord. So we'll just return because this means they're in the center of the world, which means there's not the, the application of a spherical coordinate doesn't make any sense. But um, we'll go ahead and just return a zero zero value because look rotation is correctly saying it doesn't make sense. You can't look at something when you're standing literally in the exact same spot. So we'll do that just to get rid of that that little uh, warning message, but that's okay. Um, so as part of the landing, it would be nice. So how would we do that? So coordinate manager over here right? Builds from landing spot. Um, note, this will freeze the game for a few seconds, depending on processor speed. Um, consider solutions like um, coroutines or threading. Okay, a little to do for you guys. Just just a little thing. Just just implement multi-threading. It's it's fine and a complicated thing and it's Unity, so you can't access things in different threads. You know, it's just a little. It's an easy job. Just just you get it done and you'll have no problem. <clears throat> um, <laughs> so now that we've done that, now that the terrain exists, uh, move the sh move the ship to be on the but to have to have the same um, uh, reference to be in the same reference system to be in the same reference system because keep in mind in our example right let's say if you look at our ship um, go there where the ship say at zero zero five thousand right this is five thousand meters above the zero zero latitude point right now. But when we hit land, at that point, the ship's still gonna be a coordinates zero zero five thousand, which is no longer correct because and then we can see it, right? If we hit land ship, generate the train, our ship is now off to the side because positive Z in the um, in the coordinate system that our train exists in, positive Z is, you know, I don't know, towards the camera. Whereas what we actually want after we do this landing after we hit this button, we generate the terrain. For the ship to be in the same relative position, what it would have to be is a Z of zero and a Y of 5,000. Now we're 5,000 meters above the ground at that point. That is the conversion. And all of a sudden you can see, first of all, right away, that our um, uh, the size of our moon object and the size of our terrain here doesn't really mesh. Because like when we were 5,000 units away 
in space. Although, remember, right, that was going to be in space. I think everything's changed by a scale factor of like a thousand. So in space, we weren't 5,000 meters above the surface of the ground. We were something like 5 million meters above the surface of the ground, um, which is something else we're going to have to like manage. So really, the right answer here is to be at z equals zero and a y of two, three, five million. Okay, now obviously when you're actually landing in the game, you're not going to want to land at 5 million. You're going to want to land quite a bit closer. So actually, it's more accurate to be something like if we took our spaceship and scooched us over here, maybe even closer than this, right? Like, I, I don't know at what point. Oh, I guess we don't know. How big is how big is our moon? That's the other thing. Our moon is at, this, uh, this is a scale, but I think this is the diameter. So at somewhere, let's, let's round it to... Um, 3,400, just to make the vision easier, which means at 1,700 will be just about at the surface of the moon. So effectively here, that's the other thing to consider, right, is somewhere around here, we are, let's, let's say if this actually has a radius of uh, 1,700, then at this point we are, at this point we are 45,000 meters above the surface of the planet, okay? If, if those numbers work out, at that point, we'd be 17,000 or 45,000 meters because you ignore the 17. Like you do RZ minus the radius. So let's say, again, that's an even 17. So now it's the Z minus the radius uh, means we have an, a value of 45 left in here. Multiply it by 1,000. So it's 45,000 meters above the surface, which means if we were to go and hit play at this point, hit land ship, after this, the operation should be, we set this to zero, we set this to 45,000. There we go. And then things are vaguely maybe supposed to be the similar kind of scale. Although, well, we can figure that out. That's fine. Maybe the fudge factor is different. I don't remember what our um, our math on the moon was. I just sort of eyeballed it, I think. But I could double check all that. Anyway, so that'll be next time. Next time, we will make sure the ship goes in the right place. When we hit land ship, we may literally land ship and put you right on the surface of the ground. Um, but or or we can put in two buttons. We put a button which is switch to terrain mode, and another button which is land ship that just puts the, the ship at literally on the flat surface of the of the surface. But we're also going to do the invert button, which is switch from terrain mode back to planet mode. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Thank you to all our April Patreon supporters and these mic check supporters. We've got Harry Hendel. We've got Yuko Finn, Snoopy TRB, Tiburon, Pavels Danov, Drazion, Gavin Power, Michael McClintock, Aaron Teubson, Greg Mortel, The Not So Evil Engineer, Julien Auger Lafont, Maris Fieldvold, Speedy Savant, Steven Stagger, Valiant Cake Fiend, Jason Yanity, Steven Bonnerman, Kale the Quick, and Neil Blakey Milner, and everyone who's watched, shared, favorited, and subscribed to these videos. Thank you so, so much.